I'm going to start off with a, possibly an apology to Monty Python and start with now for something completely different. Um, I'm going to try and focus on the very molecular level and I think try and link up how that molecular level is something that we can't really neglect. And the reason I say that is that actually the, um, the very phenomenon of antimicrobial resistance is multi-scale. It's inherently multi-scale in a, in a range of different ways. It is in terms of the length scales. So we're talking here about humans, organisms, population level. Then we get down to the sort of smaller scales of molecules, collections of molecules. I guess in between that you'd have organs. Um, and then, you know, ultimately we get down right down to the level of individual molecules and atoms themselves. After all, when we think about um, um, an enzyme degrading um, its natural target or an antibiotic going in to work um, and binding to a protein, that happens at the level of individual atoms. And it's that level that when we make new antibiotics, that's the level we're looking at. And so ultimately, this is a multi-scale problem. And I think following on from the previous speaker, I, I agree wholeheartedly that this is not something that can be done by one um, population of scientists or medics alone. It, it's a multi-scale problem, and so I think, I believe very firmly that the solution must also be multi-scale, not only in length scales, but also time scales, right? So, for example, if you think of how long it takes from taking an antibiotic and it beginning to have an effect, compare that to the time scales it takes for resistance to develop. They're multiple time scales, and they, they're all important in, in their own um, special contexts. So... Following on from that, I guess we've already heard um, in this session um, a lot about how mechanisms of resistance develop, and I guess we have we can divide them into two broad categories. So we can have a sort of, um, if you like, a vertical um, development where sort of get mutations and natural selection. So resistance develops from the parent to the offspring, um, where whereby a subset of bacteria may develop a mutation. That allows them to survive run and thrive in comparison to the ones that don't have this favorable mutation. And so, in effect, the antibiotic will wipe out the bacteria that don't have the mutation, and the ones that do will survive and go on to thrive. And then we can compare that with horizontal gene transfer, I guess something that most of you in the audience will know a lot more about than I do in the sense where we have acquisition of foreign DNA which becomes incorporated into the um, resistant bacterium through a bunch of different um, mechanisms. So transformation, um, transduction where um, phages are involved and conjugation where we have um, direct physical contact between the two bacterial species. But that's kind of all at the level of chromosomes and above if we're thinking about scales. So it's chromosomes and larger scales. But actually, what happens at much smaller scales, the atomistic, the molecular level? To understand that, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to give you a very short biology lesson. We must first understand the differences between gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria and understand how they're put together. And with the very simple diagram here, I've shown a schematic of a gram-negative bacterium where the pink lines on the outside represent the outer membrane of these bacteria. The purple line, which is inside, represent the cell wall. And then in green, we have the inner membrane. So gram-negative bacteria have these two membranes, which, if you like, sandwich the cell wall, which is in between. In contrast, um, gram-positive bacteria have a much thicker cell wall but only one cell membrane. So they don't have this outer cell, mem mem cell membrane, they just have the cytoplasmic membrane, but it's surrounded by a much thicker um, cell wall. And actually, it turns out that these differences are pretty important. So for example, we know that daptomycin is, um, is active against gram-positive bacteria, but not against gram-negative. And it's thought that that's the, because of the way it permeates through the cell wall. So these, these differences become important. And I've just shown you here a diagram of, if we think, zoom in, if you like, if we're thinking of this as a, a microscope and you zoom in in a bit more detail, then we can see that um, on the left there we have gram-negative bacteria. The outer membrane is really quite complex. It's composed of these 
um, molecules called lipopolysaccharides. They're large molecules which have hydrophobic tails, and then they have lots and lots of layers of sugars. Right? So in a way, it becomes like a big molecular forest that any antibiotic that's developed has to negotiate that. It has to somehow get through that to get inside, get either act on the cell wall or destroy the cell by its, active, by its action on the cytoplasmic membrane. But whatever happens, it must get through that outer membrane layer. And that's, in a, in a molecular sense, not very straightforward to do at all. Compare that with gram-positive bacteria, and you can see there in the, the, um, the purple hexagons represent the cell wall. So we have this much thicker cell wall. So it's a bit like, um, you can think of it as a big mesh with holes in it, and you have layers and layers of this, and your antibiotics have got to get through that somehow. Right? But it's a very different molecular environment to the one that's presented by um, gram-negative bacteria. They, on the other hand, have these big sugars and these hydrophobic tails. So when we think about developing new antibiotics, we, we have to also consider the molecular level, what the bacterium is that we're targeting and how we're going to do that. And so in terms of the molecular level, the mechanisms of resistant are essentially, we can again divide them into two, two categories, preventing the antibiotic from reaching the intended target or sort of pulling it out once it's there already or somehow modifying and bypassing the target of the antibiotic. And what we do in my group is we use computer simulations and this is an image from one, a simulation from my group where we are looking at an efflux pump. So in yellow there, we have the efflux pump from E. coli. This is the R&D efflux pump. Um, and the outer membrane has a bunch of native outer membrane proteins represented in blue. The bit in the mid, the, sorry, the bit at the bottom there is the inner membrane, and we've put a bunch of aquaporins and other proteins in that too. Um, in between would be the cell wall and water and lots of ions and other in, molecules that mimic the natural environment. I've just taken them out of this diagram to make it easier to see. So what we try and do is we try and mimic real life by thinking of atoms as squidgy balls, if you like, and they're connected by springs. Those springs mimic covalent bonds, and all of them move around, sort of um, driven by Newtonian, so classical mechanics, very sort of basic GCSE level physics, force equals mass times acceleration. We use that to move all the, um, the atoms around, but the atoms, the, the atoms are squidgy balls and they have chemistry associated with them. So polar ones will behave different to hydrophobic ones, for example, hybridization is included in that, stereochemistry is included in that, and we're actually able to get some insight and we're able to predict or simulate what might happen in reality. I've just put up another one here where we've looked at, this is the LPS molecule, and it turns out that resistance develops, one of the ways in which resistance develops is that some of these um, bacteria develop ways of modifying their LPS molecules. So for example, there's a, an enzyme called LPXR, which is in um, Salmonella typhimorium, which is able to actually, this molecule here has six hydrocarbon tails. What this enzyme can do is it can chop off two of the tails. It hydrolyzes them and somehow this makes the bacterium more resistant to antibiotics. We think that's because it, it, it sort of interferes with the permeability of the membrane. It makes it less susceptible. But not only that, by doing that, what happens now is that the host, so the hum, human immune system, is not able to recognize that as LPS, and so it bypasses our immune system simply by chopping off these two tails. And so again, sort of reinforces my point that this what happens at the molecular level, um, I think is pretty important. Okay, so what can we do to counter antibiotic resistance at the molecular level? I think prevention, certainly at the molecular level, is not something that we understand particularly well at the moment, and so I'm focusing on what we can do to counter it, if you like. And so novel strategies for antibiotics might include new targets. So at the moment, targets have tended to be sort of how do we stop the cell wall from growing any further? Antimicrobial peptides have been ones that sort of go in and lyse the cell membrane at the inner. But 
at the um, at the inner membrane, so the green the green part there, you'd just go and destroy that somehow. But can we think of new targets? And actually, if we take a look at processes that are absolutely essential for the growth and survival of the bacterium, then we can, it turns out we can come up with a whole bunch of new ones. So there's some work in my group at the moment on this protein called LOL-A, which is shown in the cyan there. What this protein does, I think it's pretty fascinating actually, it's, it takes um, lipoproteins from the inside of the cell, well actually it picks them up from the inner membrane, carries it all the way through the periplasm, through the cell wall, and delivers it to another protein on the outer membrane. And then that, uh, the second protein helps localize it for its correct functioning. And a whole bunch of molecules have been identified that actually interfere with that process. And we've done some computer simulations where we've shown that these molecules can go in, and actually they're hydrophobic molecules, so they make the groove, the binding groove, quite greasy. So they line the groove, making it greasy, and so when the natural protein comes in, it doesn't bind anymore. It doesn't bind in the sense that it, it just falls back out again because the groove has become greasy because you've lined it with hydrophobic molecules. Perhaps we need to do this in combination with blocking efflux pumps. Um, ultimately, we don't want to be at the point where we're using more and more, you know, sort of we keep in this vicious cycle of developing new targets, <laughs> developing antibiotics for new targets, but all the bacteria just overexpress their efflux pumps, they find them and throw them back out again. So maybe this is something we need to think of every time we come up with a new alteration to an existing antibiotic. Do we also need to do something to the efflux pumps at the same time? And again, I'm just going to finish now, this is my last sentence, with this sort of take-home message from my talk, really, which is the problem is multiscale, and, and I do believe firmly that the, um, the solutions must also be multiscale. Thank you. <laughs>